Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are, and welcome to the Strauss Center's uh, exciting new series on cybersecurity uh, with none other than Wendy Nather, who we're super excited to have both curating this series and launching it with her own talk today, as well as serving as, as a key member of the Strauss Center's cybersecurity team. Um, you guys probably already know a lot about Wendy, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and give the bio anyways. Wendy leads the advisory uh, CISO team at Cisco. She was previously research director at the Retail ISAC and research director of the information security practice at 451 Research. Wendy led IT security for the EMEA region of the investment banking division of Swiss Bank Corporation, that's now UBS, and she served as CISO of the Texas Education Agency. She was inducted into the Information Security Europe Hall of Fame in 2021, which is really cool. Wendy serves on the advisory board for Sightline Security. And as I mentioned, she's now a senior cybersecurity fellow here at the Strauss Center. Quick word about us if you're new to the Strauss Center. The Strauss Center is the University of Texas at Austin's campus-wide organization for policy-relevant research, high-impact public events, and innovative coursework and career opportunities on topics that broadly relate to international affairs, security, and especially technology. So yes, a, a wide range of things, but our integrated cybersecurity studies program is probably our flagship at the current time, the thing we spend the most uh, time and effort on, and it's something we all care about very passionately. This speaker series is an outgrowth of that. Um, we also have courses, we have events, there's research, the whole nine yards. I appreciate you guys spending your lunch hour with us today. As you know, it's webinar format, so it's uh, possible for you to put your questions into the Q&A after Wendy's given her talk, I'll come through the Q&A and I'll start pulling questions out of there to pitch to her on your behalf. So please be active. Don't feel like you have to wait till the end to put the questions in. When you have questions, go ahead and mark them there. I'll be keeping tabs. But in the meantime, let's hear from Wendy. Wendy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Bobby. Yeah, uh, it is great to be here. Uh, I'm excited. And uh, just as Bobby said, please do put questions into the Q&A. I love a good knockdown drag out chat. So please, uh, you know, any anything you want to argue about, I am here for it. Um, when we came up with this idea for Tales from the Cyberfront, the idea was to be able to tell tales about cybersecurity in the real world that you might not hear from uh, people who are actually living them because nobody wants to get up on a stage and say, so this is how we got breached. Actually, there are a couple of people who are willing to do that. And I'm gonna try to get one of them for the series. But in general, you know, people are not gonna talk about what's not going well or this is too hard because of this. So I feel as though it's kind of my uh, opportunity to tell you about things that you need to know that you might not hear. And um, I, I would really love to be able to structure the series with fascinating people from all different areas of cybersecurity, whether it's research or you know, whether it's healthcare or particular areas. And each of these, I hope, will um, bring stories to the talks that have great punchlines that we hear all the time in the real world, like, and then I opened up the New York Times and I saw, or, uh, and so I was lying in a field and I hear a drone coming, or, you know, these sorts of things that actually do happen uh, in, in the real cybersecurity world. So without further ado, let's see if we can get started here with a few stories of my own. What do you need to know about implementing cybersecurity in the real world? Well, first of all, is anybody here besides me familiar with the old nursery rhyme, for the want of a nail? For the want of a nail, a shoe was lost. For the want of a shoe, a horse was lost. For the want of a horse, a rider was lost. Uh, for the want of a rider, a battle was lost. A war was lost. A kingdom was lost, and so on. This is kind of what happens in security. There's always a series of threads leading back to something that was probably a good idea at the time. So when you are looking at uh, headlines and thinking, how did they not do this? The answer is there's a whole story reaching back to 
something that started all of it. In a lot of cases, it's kind of like, um, you know, aviation incidents. When you see that there are so many things that come together in one set of circumstances that, that make a breach happen. And so I love this uh, tweet that I borrowed from, from Jason Speckland, that the answer to what idiot did this is almost always a smart, well-intentioned person making trade-offs you hadn't even considered. Although I will be honest with you and tell you that the answer to what idiot did this, in my case, is often, oh, uh, that was me. Oh, oops, I forgot. So um, let's move on. For example, uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar with multi-factor authentication. Either you have an app on your phone that you need to use, or you have a token, uh, or you get texts and you have to type in little numbers and things like that. When you're trying to de design this as a solution for any kind of use case, you have to take into a account people who don't have cell phones at all, and we'll mention this a little bit later, people who have flip phones, not smartphones, so you can't give them a smart app to use, people who share phones, especially in um, around the rest of the world, not everybody can afford their own phone, so a family might have one or a couple might have one. People who share accounts, and yes, this happens all the time, I see you. The one who's looking guilty, I see you. I know you're sharing an account right now. People on planes who may or may not be able to use the airplane Wi-Fi and they're trying to log into their laptop and do work. People who only have Wi-Fi who never have cellular service because they're like, out in the middle of nowhere, uh, that's a big problem because when you are bootstrapping a registration for MFA, often uh, the designer wants to send an SMS message to get it started, and if you have no cellular, you can't do that. And people who panic easily, if you use any of the um, MFA solutions that have a number in it, it's like it's six digits, it's almost always six digits and you have to type it in and it's gonna change real soon and you see it starting to blink red and you start to panic. This is the sort of thing that a lot of people don't handle well. So you have to take that into account too. It almost always comes down to support burden because nobody wants to call support. It interrupts what you're doing it, it takes you away from your work and it also costs your organization money every time you have to field a call. So when we're designing security solutions, we're thinking about, are they going to have to call in or can we set up something where they can solve some of their own problems to avoid those support calls? Let's take an example, like when you have to stand up a website in a hurry. Now, this is a real example. Let's say you have three weeks to start saving lives. You have to stand up a website to offer a life-saving resource, a life-saving service to everybody, everybody in a regional area. One thing you have to do to register them is you have to uniquely identify individuals. And yes, those are individuals of all ages. If you can figure out how to uniquely identify this kid over a website, good luck. Let me know how that works. You have to protect private information because this life-saving resource, uh, you certainly don't want to leak any citizen's private information, whatever it is. You need to be able to reach everybody, not just people who are known to the state. And when I said uniquely identify individuals, you if you were immediately thinking, let's do it by social security number, eh, go to the back of the class. No, we cannot do that. And uh, a lot of people do not have their own social security numbers. They really don't. If you're trying to reach everybody, including undocumented folks, visitors, tourists, you know, anybody in an area, uh, you cannot rely on an index field like a social security number anyway. And you have to make it easy and you have to make it secure at the same time because most of these people do not have any technical background. So ready? You got three weeks, go. How would you do this? And what you end up doing is you start making trade-offs right away. 
So here are the trade-offs. If you have to uniquely identify somebody, the cheapest way to do it is to make them have their own email address because you know you can go over to Gmail, you can set up a, an email account, doesn't cost anything. Um, so everybody in a family can have their own email address. Yes, even that little baby can have their own email address. Not that they're gonna be logging in with it, but this was the quickest way that this team could think of to uniquely identify individuals. It is almost always by an email address. You can't do any MFA. It's not feasible um, because you can't send tokens out to everybody. Again, not everybody has a phone. Some people can't get SMS. Uh, anything else that you could think of within three weeks time to send out so that they would have not only their email address as a login name, not only a password, but something else to go with it. The only thing that, again, that you can really do, this is kind of poor man's MFA, is to um, send a confirmation to their email address so that they are uh, confirmed to have control of that email address. So again, you're gonna see this a lot in cases where a site's been stood up really fast. The only cheap, you know, easiest way to confirm somebody besides their password is to send a confirming email to their account. There's no time to compare data with other sources, so you cannot verify that this person really is who they say they are. You can't compare it with driving records. Well, certainly not with kids. Um, you can't, you know, compare medical records, can't compare social security records, nothing like that. So you're just going to have to take their word for it when they register and give you an email address, you can prove that they right now they have control over that email address and that's all you got. So there are a lot of these things that are suboptimal and a lot of security people go, oh my God, this is horrible, this is so insecure. But here are the trade-offs that you had to make and you had to do it in a hurry. And what are we talking about here? Yes, we are talking about a website that Austin Public Health had to stand up so that everybody could start getting coronavirus vaccines. And if you went through their site, as I did, you know, you might have noticed, oh my God, you know, this is so, this is so insecure. I can't believe we're doing this. How are they protecting my health information? The answer is they only had three weeks. They probably didn't have any budget dedicated to this. They had to do the best they could at the time. And the best they could, unfortunately, I hope they're not listening because I feel bad for them. But when I got my confirmation email, when I registered with my email address, it said, congratulations, you're confirmed. Your login is sysadmin at austinpublichealth.org. I went, sysadmin? My, my, my email address is not sysadmin. Wait, and, and now I have to set a password for it? What if I'm setting a password for the sysadmin? Well, I, I managed to find a support email address and I emailed them and they fixed it. But this is the sort of thing that happens when you are trying to do something and reach everybody under immense pressure with a lot of trade-offs. So let's not give them a hard time because yeah, I would have hated to have, have run that project. Next question you probably have is why does it take so long to fix a vulnerability? And I'm glad you asked that. Maybe you didn't ask, you should have asked. Okay, here we go. Let's talk about business fundamentals for a bit. First of all, most CIOs don't have spare people sitting around waiting to fix things. All of the resources are tightly scheduled throughout the whole development cycle. You have projects that you're working on, you've got people, usually fewer than you absolutely need, but you know, you're trying to save money and they're all dedicated to what you're working on, to the coding, um, to the testing, to deployment, to more testing, to support, um, you know, design everything. And some schedules are not changeable. Uh, for example, legislative mandates. If they say, and you agreed that you were going to have something done by a certain time, it doesn't matter that you now have to throw up this, you know, this other website to give everybody coronavirus vaccinations. 
you still have to meet the original deadlines that you told the ledge that you would do. So they don't have spare people sitting around waiting to fix things. The other thing is that if you're trying to fix an older system, it tends to have a lot of inertia. And if it's still in use, it's usually business critical. The more business critical it is, the more it costs to migrate. It has more dependencies in duct tape. Uh, especially if you don't have a lot of budget, you're going to fix things only in the most important place, which is in production. So your test environments, your development environments are kind of going to drift from the way it is in production. And unfortunately, there are legacy systems out there that outlast the people who maintain them. So the developers who understood something that nobody's touched in a decade those developers have moved on. And I don't just mean moved on as in got a different job. I mean moved on, if you know what I mean. And I think you do. There are uh, mainframes out that have been in use for 40 years. I mean, there's, you know, there is really, really old stuff out there. And the reason why it's still there is because it is very critical and it has a lot of inertia. The other thing you need to know is that remediation is more than just a code change. So you have to run scans, you have to, um, you might do static analysis, you might do dynamic analysis, uh, code reviews, all sorts of things. You have to validate those scans because a lot of them come with false positives. And then you need to prioritize the fixes based on multiple factors. So there might be not just the most critical, but also, well, if we fix this one, this is going to be dependent on a whole bunch of other things. So maybe we'll do that later. If we do this fix though, we're gonna fix it for a whole bunch of applications at the same time, or we're gonna make this fix and it is going to fix, you know, a, a good quarter of the, the flaws that we found. So this is a high value one. Uh, it might be that this one, we happen to have some time to fix uh, and we happen to have the resources available. So let's just do this one quickly while we can. There are a lot of different reasons why you might prioritize fixes the way that you do. And then you have to agree with everyone in the, you know, in the development life cycle on what you're going to change. So for example, when I was working for the state of Texas, we were going to make big changes to a very old single sign-on portal that was custom written. And at that time, our change control people had a policy that you could not make any changes to code without a documented reason why you needed to change it, which is, is fair, you know, it's fine. Um, you should not be making changes willy-nilly to code unless there's a good documented reason somewhere and you can find that traceability. The problem is if you run a scan on a 10-year-old single sign-on portal, you're going to have a 500-page PDF of results come out of it. And if you're going to try to do a traceability matrix for every single line of code that you need to, to fix based on that 500 pages worth of flaws, that's going to take you months or a year just to do that. So it was a good idea at the time, but just really not workable. I don't know if you all recognize this game here. This is mousetrap where you have to line everything up just fine um, so that you start with this and the little ball rolls here and it drops here and it snaps this and it jiggles that. And then finally the, the cage comes down and it captures the mouse. That's what um, a production life cycle is like, and you have to line everything up just right for every change for it to go through. So remediation is a lot more than a code change. There are the code fixes. In our case, we had to get the code to build on site again because we didn't have a development version of this application anymore. So we had to stand up a server. We had to get somebody to work on it in his spare time and it took him two months to get the code to build. Um, 
even though we had all the fixes in it, he did something, I can't remember what it was, but I think it was something for Maddie that ended up breaking a bunch of code. So for two months, we kept saying, are you sure you don't want some help with that? And he kept saying, no, no, it's fine. I've almost got it. So, you know, two months to get the code to build. Then we had to schedule the QA time. And, you know, they were ready two months ago. They're not ready now, they're busy. So scheduling quality assurance testing, and then identifying surprise dependencies. In one case, we found that, uh, well, we decided as part of fix that we were going to encrypt the credential string that had the user's password in it, because that's a really good practice to use in security is encrypt your passwords. So we thought this would be good, encrypt the credential string. And then we found that this string was being passed to some applications, one of which was actually trying to read that password. I don't know why. There was no reason why it needed to read that password because the, the user was already authenticated in the portal. But because we encrypted the password and it couldn't read it anymore, it, it broke that application. So we had to find somebody to go fix that application, then go back, start from the beginning, get the code to build, schedule the QA. You see how this goes on. And it went on and on and on. And the bottom line was, uh, I had hired an outside team to fix the code and they were great. They turned it around in six weeks. Deploying the fixed version to production took a year. This is why fixing vulnerabilities can take so long. So now let's talk about WannaCry. Does everybody remember WannaCry? Everybody that you know took down a bunch of stuff ransomware and everything. And again, you're probably asking, why couldn't they just patch? Well, here's why. Um, depending on what industry this is in and what kind of application it is, there are long recertification times. You have to make sure that once you fix the application, that it works with everything. If you work in manufacturing, industrial control systems, you might have to test it against uh, standards and compatibility with um, a bunch of different countries around the world. I remember talking with the head of Siemens one time uh, of their development, and he said to make a change in their life cycle, they had to plan two years ahead. So these things take a really long time. In other systems, the vendor controls the system. I remember having some uh, Bloomberg terminals that we were not allowed to touch. And we had to notify them, you know, there's a virus on, on this machine. And they said, well, OK, we'll, we'll get to it, but you can't touch it. Can we put antivirus on it? No, you can't. So um, again, there are a lot of things that the vendor will not allow you to touch. It will, will cancel their support if you change anything. And there are non-patchable systems. Uh, one time when I was getting a CAT scan, I happened to ask the technician how old that scanner was and they said oh you know i don't know 10 15 years or something and i said do you patch it a lot and they said oh no there are, um it's already taken as many patches as it can possibly hold we can't apply anymore so um yeah the, this stuff goes on everywhere if you want to if you want some fun before your next scan ask the technician so here's a friend of mine, a quote, uh, who was slight, he was slightly upset, uh, who said, and he was talking about, I think he was talking about a vendor. Let's hope he was talking about a vendor. They are lunatics in as much as they think they are all knowing about how healthcare should work and are completely freaking disconnected from the realities of how healthcare actually does work. If we actually did what they suggest, people would die but they die securely, wouldn't they? And that's all we care about, right? So this was somebody really venting his spleen about how annoying it is if you are a CISO and somebody comes in trying to tell you how sh you should do your job. Um, so d don't go and lecture somebody about how they should just be patching. That's, that's the thing here. Um, again, please put in questions in the QMA. Um, would love to talk about this some more. So there are two big dichotomies when you're trying to implement security. It's safety versus security. And we just saw an example of this in healthcare where 
Uh, I heard one great quote from a doctor that said, I do not want my patient to die on the gurney with their privacy intact. They will take availability over anything else. If they have to get rid of a password to do it, then that's what they'll do because they have to get in really, really fast. Uh, it's the same thing in aviation. There's a great talk by Dan Glass, who used to be the CISO of American Airlines, and he was finally allowed to talk about some things that usually aviation CISOs are not allowed to talk about. Um, when they patch, for example, when they patch software on board, you cannot just sit on a plane and hack the system through the entertainment system. I'm sorry, you can't. Um, it, I know there was somebody who claimed to be able to do it, but all my aviation CISO friends said, yeah, he really didn't, but we can't say anything. We're not allowed to speak up. So in order to patch an airplane, you have to have somebody in the front of the airplane, somebody in the back of the airplane, somebody on the ground. Um, and so they make it so that you cannot do anything really fast or really easy on a plane. Fail fast does not work when you're in an airplane. So here, are, these are a lot of things that get, um, that get talked about. There are also big differences in company culture that influence what kind of security they can do. There are some companies that are just bleeding to lead. They have to have the newest of everything. So as a CISO, you can't tell somebody, no, you cannot bring in this new framework because they've got to have the newest of everything. You have to just try to keep up with them and figure out how to secure what they just brought in. Never disrupt the guest experience is big in hospitality. So there are certain things that you just cannot give uh, your user if you uh, run security for a hotel. You can't give them fancy MFA because if it annoys them, they're going to go to a different hotel and they're not going to come back. Um, if you have a new appointee that becomes the leader after every election, you will find your security programs and your IT programs are going to be changing like the wind back and forth all the time. So there are security projects that take years and they may get interrupted before you can finish them. Then there's the, the culture of if you are a security vendor, you'd better be good at it yourself. So it's easier to go to somebody and say, look, we're going to look really bad if we don't fix this. But in other, in other cultures, you know, the CTO is going to say, who cares? Really, you know, nobody's going to hack us on this. And that leads to the big problem of two different views of probability and risk. A CISO might have one view of how likely something is, and the management may have a completely different view. So um, they might agree with you that, yes, if, we, if this were to happen, we agree the impact would be this big. We would lose $11 billion worth of federal funding. But we just don't think that's going to happen. And so that's the big gap that CISOs have when they're trying to talk and convince their management that really know the probabilities a lot higher. And also the real support cost. If we do this, it's going to cost us this much in support and we know this for sure. It can outweigh a breach cost that may or may not happen. So this is leads to what I call cheeseburger risk management. This is the, the risk management model where you decide that you're going to eat cheeseburgers until your first heart attack, and then you're going to stop. How many of you do that? It's okay. I'm not looking. Um, it, it actually makes a lot of sense because if you are a business person, you are not going to spend any money that you don't have to until you absolutely need to. So the trick is trying to figure out what you need to buy in security just before you need it, not well before you need it. Like, you know, you, you spent a year spending a million on security that you didn't actually need until later. The timing is everything. So for a lot of organizations around, out there, and, and I know of another, uh, another CTO of a Texas-based organization that was being briefed on a potential attack, and actually said, let's just wait until they actually attack us. This was, this was a real quote. A lot of organizations do do that. And 
Um, sometimes it makes sense from a business standpoint. Again, if you had to spend a million a year to do security, uh, to do a security program, and you didn't get breached, and, and you just put it off, and you didn't get breached until your second year, and it almost only cost you $500,000 for breach, you came out ahead. You saved a million the first year, and you saved 500000 the second year. That's good money management. So you, you, if you think of it this way, you really cannot argue in some cases with, um, with organizations that say, we're not going to roll out everything, just what we think is enough. Uh, here's another real quote from a CISO friend of mine, um, this one working for a telco provider. Sometimes we have to wait for a breach to get justification for what we already know needs to be done. When we're lucky, it's somebody else's breach. So if they hear about a peer that gets breached, that makes it probable enough in the eyes of the management, that they'll say, okay, I guess we better spend the money now. And so if you are a provider, let's say that, um, you want to roll out encryption, a new, a new version of encryption to your point of sale systems. And you would have to roll 27,000 trucks to go to all your retail locations to do this because you have to do this upgrade in person. You're probably going to put it off until a peer gets attacked and then, okay. So this friend of mine actually went through this, was trying to get permission, and as soon as the breach of the peer hit the papers in within three days they got the permission to sp to do the spend on the encryption so timing a lot of this is timing now i want you to, to lean in closer closer come in a little bit closer look me in the eyes this is important if you're appalled by all of this you haven't been paying attention okay this stuff happens all the time and i will give this talk and people come up to me later and say yeah that's us don't tell anybody this is the state of cybersecurity, not just in the u.s but around the world most the vast majority of organizations ha struggle with security um, either they're not spending because they can't or they don't have the expertise they don't have the influence we can talk about this another time um, but this is the way it is. The problem is that a lot of security is designed assuming that everybody is in an Olympic size swimming pool. And so it's kind of a, you know, one size is supposed to fit all. Everybody's supposed to do it this way. You're supposed to have network segmentation. You're supposed to have uh, least privilege, all this great stuff. But the problem is that we're not in a swimming pool. Everybody's in the open ocean. And they're in different parts of the open ocean. Some are in the Pacific, some are in that big floating trash bin out in the Pacific. Some are in um, the Caribbean where it's really nice and calm and warm until a hurricane comes through. There is all kinds of different conditions in the ocean that each organization has to deal with. And I know that there are some security people who say, oh, you know, nobody's a snowflake. You know, everybody says they are, but they're not. No, they really are. If you work with enough organizations, you will see that even if they have some of the same problems, the reason why they have the problems is different and the only feasible way to address them is different. And this is something else that you need to know when you're trying to come up with a solution for, you know, a, a huge population of diverse organizations. Not only is everybody in the open ocean, but they all have a security kraken that, that everybody knows about in the organization that they don't talk about. It might be, oh yeah, everybody knows that, that that application is just so insecure. Oh my God, we all know we've been trying to fix it for years. Or we all know that this, um, this C-level person hates this vendor, so they will never bring them in even though we really need their solution. Or we know but we don't actually run our own network so there's nothing we can do about that part everybody's got a security kraken so if you talk with a CISO and they really trust you they will tell you what the security kraken is that everybody knows about something like this here's another real quote 
um, aren't you worried about Heartbleed, which was an attack on OpenSSL? And uh, the person said, no, because we don't use encryption. And this is why we drink, by the way. This is why security people drink, cry, um, eat lots of cheeseburgers, you know, you name it. Um, here's another one. Why can't you scan something? Well, Nessus, the vulnerability scanner, I'd heard this story that they were trying to run a Nessus security scan against systems on a shop floor in manufacturing. And there was a rumor that, no, 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 you can't run it because the shop laser, if, if the Nessus scan hits that system, it will cause the laser to turn around 180 degrees and fire. And of course, nobody wanted to test that. Uh, so, you know, that's what they said, you could not run Nessus. And I didn't know for a long time whether this was true or not. But I told this story up on stage and then later somebody came to me afterwards and said, oh yeah, I was there. No, it's a true story. It really does turn around and fire. So there you go. Another really true story with lasers and stuff. So the question is, can we fix this? Because we want to be able to fix this. This is why we're here. Can we do this? And this is Margaret Hamilton who wrote, uh, and under her tutelage, most of the code was written for the, what was it, uh, what was it, Bobby, Apollo 11? Was it the, the Apollo space program in general? I'm trying to remember. Anyway, she wrote most of the code. And yes, this couldn't be a moonshot if we are going to fix the cybersecurity problems out there. And um, who knows? Uh, this may be, th this is my personal opinion, this may be as complicated to fix as healthcare reform because there are, you know, technical issues. I just talked about some organizational issues, logistical issues. Um, there are complicated security poverty issues, reasons why you can't fix things. There are economic incentives. There are political reasons. There are even things that we believe in our culture uh, that are in, in, that are inherent to how we solve problems that we may have to address. Uh, if you believe, for example, that if you get sick, it's your fault for not being healthy, you may also feel that if an organization is breached, it's its own fault for not having done the right things security-wise, even if they couldn't. So um, the whole campaign to fix cybersecurity across the board, I think is, I don't think we understand all the factors that go into it yet, why it's so difficult. I think we need to study it more. And so that's why I think this program is so badly needed. Um, and uh, then also, you know, we're going to need you because frankly, I'm getting old and I'm getting tired. I've been doing this for 25 years and some things are just not getting any better. So clearly, I do not know what the answer is, uh, but maybe you do. So I'm gonna hand this back to Bobby now and let's see what people say in the Q&A. And also feel free to contact me on Twitter or email me, uh, would love to chat. Awesome, Wendy, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody for the great questions that are already starting to pop up in the Q&A. Please add more, but we'll jump right in. Um, Sandy asks, how do we raise the urgency level and educate people and accomplish this end without spreading too much fear, uncertainty, and doubt, or, or the dreaded FUD? The dreaded FUD. Yes, you're right. And, and that's a really good question because we kind of assume in a lot of ways that um, if they don't, if they're not doing all the security that we think they ought to do, it's either because they're ignorant or they're dumb or they're lazy or they're, they're apathetic, you know, or they're malicious or anything. I don't think it's any of those things. Uh, again, if you work with an organization and say, why aren't you doing this? They will as like as not have a really good reason for it, or it was a good reason at the time. And they go, yeah, that was then, I guess we should fix that now. But it's not necessarily a question of uh, awareness because if we could just train them louder, uh, you know, and uh, educate them harder, uh, I think we would have done that by now. I don't think the answer is 
you know, just to say, hey, you know, you got to do this because I'm sure everybody can think of risks that they take every day where somebody says, you know, you really shouldn't be doing that. And you go, yeah, I know, but dot, dot, dot. Um, so I think, again, I think the answer is more complicated than just educating. I think education is part of it, but we have to meet them where they are. And uh, we have to map things to the things that are important to them, which are usually business imperatives. Uh, Robert asks about industry specific standards. So um, let me kind of riff on that and ask, are there a couple of industries we think, okay, maybe we don't need one generic one size fits all approach, but here's an industry where there's strong need for stepping things up, that industry is not getting it done. And there's something about that industry that you could have more prescriptive rules tailored to their environment. Uh, does anybody strike you as a candidate for that sort of treatment? Um, it, well, you know, the, there are a lot of organizations that, um, or a lot of, a number of industries that are working on that in a lot of areas. If you take healthcare, for example, um, you know, that we have enacted legislation that is called for higher levels of, of security. Um, the, um, uh, the card issuers came out with PCI DSS. Um, to you know, as a standard to cover their particular risk scenario. And it's actually easier to be prescriptive when you have a small, very well understood risk scenario, like you're trying to protect a string of credit card numbers. That's a lot easier to do than to say, okay, you got to secure all of healthcare, no matter what you're doing in healthcare. Um, so there are attempts to do that. And I think we will continue to do that. But um, that's a lot of the discussions that um, policy groups have today is what can we reasonably prescribe that we know is gonna work, that we know is doable, that we can verify is being done, that doesn't cost too much, that doesn't give an unfair advantage to you know some vendor that has a monopoly on whatever it is you know we're gonna prescribe for them. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, what do you think, Bobby? Yeah, you know, just like you said, you, as you enumerate those factors, and we start imagining like the the pie shrinking as you as the factors are accounted for, you get into this very narrow space. Um, my general view is that, um, in, to some extent, for certain industries, the insurance industry can play a, a more adaptive and nimble approach, perhaps, or at least I used to think that. I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if maybe that faith was misplaced. Um, let me go now to a great, we get, we have an IOT question from Byron LaFleur. Byron, good to see you. Um, so Byron points out, you, you hear a lot of anxieties about the insecurity of IOT devices, hard coded passwords, you know, the whole nine yards. Um, how significant is the threat? Well, it depends on what you define as a thing, uh, because some people include industrial control systems in with IOT security. I'm not sure if that's fair or not, but uh, you know, depending on what the thing is, it can let's be. Let's split that huge up. Impact. Let's, let's okay. set to the side the things that are the broader category and go towards the sort of the mundane retail stuff: baby monitors, home doorbells, uh, you name it, toasters, refrigerators. Starting with that stuff, do we need to worry about it? And what's what's the nature of the danger there? And then let's scale out to things like connectivity for cars as a notable example. Yeah, there you go. Um, well, there's all sorts of impact and uh, potential impact. And of course, we've heard the scary stories about baby monitors, violation of privacy, surveillance, accidental surveillance, data leakage, um, the ability to um, you know, collapse something or overheat a coffee maker or, or you know, th those sorts of things. Those are, there are definite safety issues in there. There are even things like I saw an, an, a Kickstarter for an internet connected uh, tennis shoes where you could it, <laughs> really, where you could, you know, it, display your own um, designs on it. And the first thing I thought was, oh, my God, I would totally hack my friend's shoes oh, in yeah. school and make them say dirty words and get them in trouble because of dress code. 
and and or I would put you know the notes for my exam on my shoes and read them. But then they said, okay, now we're going to build a marketplace where you can buy and sell designs. And I thought, well, let's just throw money into this. That makes it even more dangerous because wherever there's money, there's going to be people trying to steal the money. Um, so depending on the functionality of any of these IoT things, there's um, first of all the the first uh, and most obvious risk, then there are ones that you haven't thought about. Then there's the issue of being able to update that thing, or if it was designed simply to be obsoleted, to be thrown out, and say, well, if this has a, a security flaw in it, just throw it out and get a new one. I don't know how we are going to handle that, and if we are going to draw the line at a certain cost of remediation, or a certain cost of update if we are going to say that the consumer should not be held responsible for identifying and and updating their software um you know it the, the the vendor should be doing it all the time i don't know when my when my husband's um connected coffee warmer cup has a firmware update he does it himself but is that fair to ask anybody who buys that coffee cup to do it I don't think so. Again, there are societal things that we need to decide on where responsibility and accountability lies. That's more than just, you know, how do we patch this IoT thing? So in the short run, hold on to your old testers so that you don't end up with a hacker burning your test for you. Uh, Bob has a really interesting question here about whether and to what extent the existence of the NIST framework uh, can be and is seized upon by CISOs to better make their case to the C-suite about the need for budget to invest in security resources. Uh, and then related to that, is it also a good bridge in practice to connect up to the, uh, to the, the larger, either the, the legal department, the compliance department and organizations to build alliances? You know, are people leveraging NIST in that way? Uh, they are, they really are. And, um, the great thing, well, there are good and bad things about NIST. Um, the great thing is that just about everybody knows about it now, and can, everybody has a common frame of reference when they're talking about particular things, which is great. Um, the bad thing is that some of these things are where um, they say, well, if you think you have this risk, then you should be doing this. And again, there's that if if you think you have this risk. So again, you're arguing with your management about, we do have this risk, therefore we should be doing what NIST says. And then finally, NIST and security itself is so comprehensive that even starting down the road is difficult. I, I know another uh, CISO friend of mine uh, at a state agency who said, yeah, we started working on NIST and, NIST and we started identifying all our information assets, but we're only trying to identify uh, or we're only working with the first 20 things in the list. We can't do all of them. And it's going to take us a year just to do the first 20. So it is so overwhelming, um, you know, even when you start with just one standard and try to stick to it, that um, just saying NIST is not it's not going to be the answer to everything, uh, unfortunately. Rats. Well, yeah. uh, <laughs> Willie has a question about bug bounty programs. Bug bounty programs have come a long way over the years. Mm -hmm. um, would you say, what would you say about the question of how much have they been integrated into production life cycles or development life cycles? Um, how sophisticated have organizations gotten to trying to bring that particular tool for problem spotting? Uh, into the pipeline of productivity. Um, yeah, bug bounties have grown so much. And, you know, we have people like Katie Masuris to thank for that, who um, pushed this through at Microsoft. And I still don't know how she did that <laughs> and even got convinced the Pentagon to put up a bug bounty program. The The biggest thing, and, and she will tell you this, is that you have to be sure that you can act on what you get, because uh, otherwise you're just going to be messing up your program. Uh, if you're not ready and able to remediate based on what the, the bounty brings in, um, then it's going to be useless. And I talked about how difficult remediation is. So this is this is the bigger thing. It's not as sexy as the bug bounty part, but you will generally find that the larger companies that are successfully using bug bounty programs 
have incredibly efficient remediation um, and, and software development lifecycle pipelines behind it. They had to stand all that up first before they could do the bug bounty part. The other thing is that you can't just throw out a bug bounty and expect it to find everything that you need. You know, you still have to be doing your own queuing and testing and searching internally uh, because unfortunately bug bounty program is only as good as the the people um, who are doing it and their level of interest in, in in testing yours. If nobody wants to test yours, you're not going to find anything. So um, th those are those are the problems. It's a, it's a great add on if you are at that level of sophistication, and uh, it it certainly is helpful. But it takes a lot of resources to manage that bug bounty program. You have to have somebody answering all the emails, going yes, we know, we already patched this, or no, this really isn't a problem. This is a typo, this is not a bug. Thank you. You know, and, and sifting through all of that kind of stuff. The other thing is that when you get a report of a vulnerability, it's not just a matter of fixing it and pushing it out. Um, working with any other entities that have dependencies on that code, or simply figuring out how to advise your customers and um, let them know what they need to fix or what you're going to roll out and how they need to use it is is very complicated. For example, you may need to create a tool that will check to see which of your customers are affected by this flaw. And then you might want to write another tool that will help them automate the remediation or you know their part of fixing it. When you fix your part, they have to do something else. So you might write a tool for them to do that. All of this kind of, you know, plays out in the remediation process so that that kind of turned into a rant but yes bug bounty's cool not enough oh those those sorts of measures sound both very useful and also like tasty additional attack surface and attack vectors um, if it's not done right yeah. uh, this relates a little bit to a question sanjit asks about uh code bases and whether it's framed as should we change how we write our software so it's easier to patch and I would just modify that a little bit by asking, have you seen change over time where code is being developed in a way that's more conscious of security, secure by design, including uh, written in a way that is architected to be more easily uh, fixed when necessary? Is that Have we gotten smarter on the front end over time? Uh, some have. I have seen that. But the downside to making something easy to patch is it also makes it easier to change without intention, either mm -hmm. accidentally or maliciously. So especially if you, going back to IoT, if you've got things that are easy to patch, if it's easy to patch your refrigerator, any you know you, the, the vendor can do it without you having to touch it, then it means anybody who breaks into the vendor can go and patch your refrigerator for you in ways that you don't like. So that's a tricky trade-off. Um, we are getting better at some things. Um, for example, if, um, let's say that um, I'm familiar with the, the school finance uh, formulas here in Texas, which are so complicated and they change all the time, it is much easier to externalize those business rules in another part of the application so that every time the legislature decides to change a formula, you don't have to rewrite the whole application to do it. You change a rule in the business rules engine. So that sort of design is definitely uh, coming to the fore um, for things that you expect to need to change. There are other things where, yes, you can modularize things, you can make things more granular, you can do microservices, but as you get smaller and, and more atomic, with those things, yes, it makes those easier to fix, but then also you have a larger variable um, distributed surface to manage. So you're, you're kind of dealing with two, again, it's more trade-offs. Um, I'm afraid that's not a really good answer, but that's, oh. that's what I got. <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, going back to the topic of insurance, uh, I mentioned this earlier, my, my longtime hope that the insurance industry would apply really meaningfully useful pressures. Um, what sort of change over time have you seen, if any, with insurance companies actually bringing to bear 
positive incentives for change that are that are not just general directions, but that are concrete in some kind of useful way that will produce a result that wouldn't have obtained otherwise? Um, from an economic um, incentive perspective, I think insurance, you know, provides a really good function. The problem is still actuarial data. It is really hard to get, um, you know, a good enough data for incidents that were not um, mandatory to report. And so um, security incidents can be internal. They can be, you know, they're not always an external attacker uh, coming in, stealing some data or installing ransomware. Uh, they may be, you know, where you have a, a, a rogue system administrator in Singapore who decides to take over all of the um, all of the servers that you put out there and, and they change the root passwords so that you can't access them anymore. Is that a security incident? Yes. Is it worth reporting to anybody externally? No. Um, so there's a whole, there's a whole landscape of security incidents that organizations have to deal with that insurers don't necessarily know about and, and won't know about. Having said that, um, again, the incentives from the insurance side, where nothing else works, um, when you are working with management and you cannot get them to agree that there's a certain probability of risk, there are two things they will always believe in. They will believe in the insurance <laughs> premiums and they will believe in the auditor. So if you uh, bring up the risk of non-compliance, they will generally be you know, more amenable to managing that risk. And if there's a risk of premiums going up, they will be more amenable to managing that risk. So if you're a clever CISO, you may want to cast some of the things that you want to do anyway into those risk buckets instead of just saying, you know, there might be a bad hacker with a hoodie uh, who, who might do this. Um, so, yeah, in the ecosystem, they do great. Again, the problem is if you are trying to manage a very generalized risk case, it is really hard to get prescriptive. And if it it's hard to get prescriptive, then it's hard to negotiate with the insurer to say, no, we really did what you wanted us to do. And if they say, well, no, that's not it. Um, you know, if they say use MFA and you say, well, we're checking their their email addresses, that's their other factor. And then they go, well, that's not good enough. So these are the, the, the arguments you, you get into. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done, which reminds me, I'll see if I can get a, an insurer to come in uh, for this talk series. That would be that, fun. That would be great. Um, Larry asks about quantum computing and the progress and then as the qubits mount up. Um, how significant do you perceive that looming technological wave uh, to be for both uh, defense and offense? I mean, is this this gets hyped mm -hmm. pretty heavily mm -hmm. in some quarters? Mm -hmm. The death of encryption, or or the, or the rebirth of encryption. Should we be concerned about this, or is this a problem for a decade from now? Um, well, when in doubt, when it comes to crypt uh, cryptography. Um, and quantum anything, I always look to Matthew Green and and he says, first of all, the whole um, quantum computing is separate from quantum cryptography as, as issues. And um, just about everybody that I have asked, including people who work in high performance computing have said, yeah, we are like a decade out from having to worry about this. It's, it's fun to worry about and it's cool because it's new but um yeah that it, having worked as an analyst and seen people who are trying to solve these problems right now i've seen years go by before they ever had something they could start to bring just to demonstrate and once they demonstrate it usually can only work in a particular situation and well, same to you, Bobby. <laughs> yeah, there goes um, the book that I was holding that up with. You were, um, you were going to throw the book at me. That's um, right. Yeah, it, it's it, it's one of these things that's really fun to think about, but no, uh, for ninety nine percent of the world out there, this is not going to be a thing for a long time. Well, that's a perhaps happy note to end on. I want to thank you so much for your time, and I want to apologize for those in the audience whose questions we didn't get to. 
but we're at the appointed hour and there's much more to come in this series so make sure you're on the strauss center's distribution list if you want to make sure you're hearing about this and other events that we host uh wendy thank you very much you are as always as advertised and it's great to spend time with you <laughs> you, you too bobby thanks so much thanks to everybody for coming and i'll see you next time